Thursdays. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you for letting me speak on Thursday night. This is my first time on Thursdays, I think. I've spoken a number of times on Wednesday, but uh, we had a little bit of scheduling issues, so I'm the backup when uh, we have holes in the schedule. And I think you'll like this program. I just presented it last week to a local group, and I presented it a couple times. And as usual, uh, there's only a few slides in my presentation. Tonight's portable operation and field radio operations. All the materials are available at tiny.cc slash port op. And uh, I'll give you that again later, but you're going to need that because anytime you see this little symbol, that's a link in the program. And there's a lot of links in tonight's program. There's also a lot of videos and I'm not going to play the video for you tonight. I'll let you watch the, watch the video on your own. My contact information, kzt at awrl.net. My website, kzt.com. So when we talk about portable and field operations, there's a wide variety of different operation types. And uh, some of the topics we're going to cover tonight will be the different types of operations, antennas, power sources, miscellaneous, ass miscellaneous accessories, uh, planning for your portable operation, packing, setting up, and operating. And I think you might recognize this young gentleman out here in the field operating. I'll let you guess who that is. So when we're talking about portable and field operation types, uh, one of the biggest ones that many of us had our first experience operating in the field was field day. Um, and that's one of the big ones. Another one is the OATAs, the blank O8 on the air. So fill in the blank with parks, islands, summits, and you get POTA, IOTA, and SOTA. And there's many more of these, and they're all different types of portable operations uh, with specific locations. Some people like to contest portably. They might set up in a rare multiplier, uh, or they may go roving and activate multiple multipliers, especially counties or grids in the VHF or UHF contest and in the state QSO parties. It's very common for mobiles and rovers to be a big portion of the operation. Emergency operations are quite often take place in the field because you have to leave your house to go out where the emergency's at. And then there's all sorts of people that like to go hunting for things like counties, grids, etc. And some of those don't have active hams in it, so it's very important that someone goes out to activate them. The expeditions, of course, are the the panoptical type of uh, field operation where you go to a rare location. Sometimes a rare location has all the amenities of home, but other times it's a desolate island, and so the range of de types of the expeditions can range greatly. Uh, a lot of us like to take a radio with us when we go vacationing, and sometimes we're Rare DX, sometimes we're just another portable location. And then, of course, there's the ultimate in portable operation when you carry the radio yourself and your pedestrian mobile. We can operate on all the different bands, many different modes, many different types of operations, everything from satellites to microwaves to HF. Even direction finding is a form of portable operation when we go out doing fox hunts, hidden transmitters, etc. We can operate on a variety of bands and using a variety of different modes. One of the things I wanted to mention real quick on the HF end of things, because we have such a wide variety of bands available on HF, we can choose the type of bands we want when we're doing a portable operation based on how far we want to be able to communicate. So for local communications, 10 meters, 80 meters, and 160 can be very good because they won't skip over the local area in many cases. Uh, whereas if we want a little more distance, we can count on the upper bands, 20 meters to 10 meters. And for intermediate operations, nothing sort of beats the intermediate band itself, 40 meters. One of the things that determines the type of operation is how you get there, the transit aspect of it. How are you getting to that portable location? Are you going on foot? When you're going on foot, there's often a premium placed on light weight and small size, especially if you're hiking in. But sometimes your foot travel only involves the final lug from the parking lot to the site. So it may not be that far and it may not be that dependent on uh, hiking, whereas if you're hiking for multiple days to get to a location. And then, uh, of course, you might be operating too while you're moving on foot, and that'd be pedestrian mobile. We could use a bicycle or a motorized scooter, bike, e-bike, etc. We could use a car or truck. And when we start using these type of mobile devices, it's very common that people will operate while in motion, or they might park before they operate. 
And once you park, you become stationary with the possibility of additional and extra antennas. So you can bypass that antenna that's not that great on the car by putting up a, a long wire in the trees or something like that. Or maybe put up a beam. This chart, of course, is for you to go through later. All my slideshow presentations are reference documents, and you can go through this later. And it basically goes through the, all the different types of, do, of operations I talked about. And it talks about things like transportation, primary considerations, the type of antennas, power sources, miscellaneous accessories, how to pack your equipment, set up, and operation. So there's a chart for you to go through later. With portable and field operations, there's a conundrum. There's trade-offs. If you want more gain from your antenna, you need a bigger size antenna. But if you want a very small portable antenna, then you might have to give up on a little bit of gain. If you want increased radio output power, then you need increased battery case capacity, and that means you need a bigger battery, and that's more weight. If you increase your battery power, you have more weight. If you, low, if you have a lower gain signal, uh, then you can decrease the power, and uh, you maybe decrease the antenna, and then you have to go to something that's more efficient modes, either CW or FT8 or FT4. Maybe single sideband is out of the picture when you're down to a half a watt and you're using a small wire antenna. If you want, uh, if you increase, uh, go to increasingly efficient modes such as FT8 or FT4, you have less potential audience for the QSOs because not everyone operates those modes. And you need people with more specialized skills if they're operating CW. So there's trade-offs all the time uh, in this uh, idea of portable communication. Another chart, again, for reference later on, but I just want to point out a couple things on this chart real quick. I know it's kind of small, but again, we have the different types of operating from different locations or how you get to that. And I always say that even if you have physical handicaps or you're not that spry and able to get around, you can still operate portable from your mobile. You know, you can pull your vehicle up, park it stationary, and operate portable that way without having to hike in over or climb a mountain to get there. These are some examples of people operating on the move on foot. This is pedestrian mobile. Some people have little carts. Some people have little uh, two-wheel dollies. Some people like to hold it in their hand. Some people like to strap it on their back. This gentleman's using his uh, KX2 as an HT. Um, He's actually wasting his other hand, though, because he's holding a microphone here, and there's a little microphone actually right on the front of the KX2. There's a little tiny pinhole. So you, wouldn't, you don't even need that extra microphone. Uh, one of the people that's pretty famous, with call sign it's famous, is the W3FF Buddy Poles, a uh, very good, uh, popular antenna for pedestrian mobile operation. Uh, this last uh, month, I this, this year I've been trying to complete the clean sweep of all the QSO parties in the U.S. for the QRP for the QSO party challenge. The problem was I was on a train heading to California during the weekend of the California QSO party, but I wasn't going to get to my destination until after the party was over. So that meant that I was going to have to take advantage of a 10-minute break at one of the stations along the way on Amtrak, jump out, and try and get at least my two contacts in. Fortunately, I was able to get three contacts in at Glenwood uh, Springs, Colorado, using my KX2 and the AX1 antenna. And then I got a cut, so I operated out of state for the party, and then I actually got a short stop in Sacramento at the station and worked as an in state station. So, the different types of portable operation operators uh, you can have solo, one person does everything. It, but it's always fun to have someone helping you. So, you can have a pair of people working together, they might share time on one radio, or you might even bring multiple radios in, and you can support multiple bands and modes at the same time. Uh, you can have a whole group like we do at field day, and you can work in shifts. You can even have some people that maybe don't want to operate the radio, but want to cook and support and help set everything up. One of the things you can decide on is what type of pace you want to take during your operations. Do you want to have a casual laid back operation? Is it more vacation and recreation than radio operations? But you couldn't leave that radio home because it's too much fun to have it with you. Or you're going to be competitive with high activity, maximize the number of contacts, including a mix of calling CQ and hunt and pounce. Or is you really going to have an intense operation where you're going all out, going to be running CQ, calling CQ the whole time running and try and get as many points as possible. So you can choose the pace you want. I want to stop and take a breath here for a second and pour myself some, a drink, but I want to let this slide sink in because this is extremely important. 
putting your antenna into electrical wires can kill you. And when you're in the field, you don't necessarily know or aware of where all the electrical wires around you are. So before you ever put up an antenna in the field, always check out the situation thoroughly and don't go ha don't go the minimum distance away go twice as far away from the electrical uh, wires as you think you need to be i have a whole section here on antennas and you can actually click right here on this link this is a sheet i originally put together for field day for a local club and it's just grown and grown over the years let me zoom in on this a little bit but it basically goes through pros and cons of different types of portable antennas but then it also has sections on different types, half wave, non-resonant, resonant, non-resonant, non end fed, inverters and slopes, verticals, beams, 160 meters, magnetic loops, integrated antennas. Those are the ones that are attached to the radio itself directly. Mobile antennas, VHF and UHF, and general antenna resources. And this this, this uh, document has both uh, commercial and homebrew antennas and again that's available at tiny.cc slash uh, port antenna and I'll put that in the chat here real quick because that is an important one for you so back to our regularly scheduled program so Let's start out small. Let's start talking about portable operation with a handheld and trying to get more distance out of that. So this I call this DXing with a handheld. And I actually wrote an article for the uh, for the DX Engineering on all bands blog. And you can read that at this link here, DXing with a handheld, what you need to know. It talks about ways to improve your signal, both through antennas and power amps and other things. But a quick way to improve your HT signal is by attaching an a, a tiger tail to it. It's simply a small counterpoise that uses the grounding portion of your antenna connection. It's about 19 inches typically on an HT for two meters. And you can notice a drastic improves improvement in your signal. Or instead, you might choose something like this antenna at the bottom here that extends out. This is a dual band antenna, and it extends out to a couple feet long, and uh, it can really increase your signal. Or maybe you have a rolled up J-pole antenna made out of twin lead uh, that you can hang up and get it up high, and these can be great ways to improve your signal. Or even having a small uh, gain antenna such as a, a Yagi or Maxon, Moxon can uh, be very helpful. Or you might add a small RF amp. But being a QRP person as I am, I usually go for the antenna first before I think about adding an amp. Um, integrated antenna, as I mentioned a little earlier, uh, handheld rubber duck would be an example of an integrated antenna, but there's also some integrated antennas available for HF radios uh, for pedestrian mobile operation. And again, the buddy pole I mentioned earlier and the super antenna here, uh, WIP, uh, the portable telescopic antennas, including the MFJ 1899T, uh, I think the HFJ is a Comet. I have the Aircraft AX1. These are all compromised antennas. Don't expect perfect operations with them, but they do work. But do remember that most of them still need a counterpoise. That counterpoise can make a huge difference in whether these integrated antennas work with your radio. Also, being out in the clear, away from other objects, can be very helpful. That's why I actually after I took those pictures, I stepped a little bit further away from the train cars. Um, vehicle mounted antennas uh, for mobiles are one another type of integrated antenna you might have that doesn't require being set up at the site. Uh, I talked about having a portable antenna, a J-pole made out of twin lead. Here's an example of one J1 SLP, uh, easy peasy, dual band J-pole. Um, and again, even though you might get there in a mobile and the radio might be in the car, think about an extended antenna arrangement for once you get there and park. Uh, having a mast with a vertical or small beam on it can make a big difference. Magnetic loops are a very portable antenna and they're fairly light and easy to carry around. They're sort of a pain on HF a lot of times though because every time you QSY, you have to retune them. But if your operation is such that you're calling CQ on the same frequency all the time, or you're running a net, or you're doing tactical communications, or you're using a mode like FT8 or FT4, which doesn't require you to constantly be retuning the radio, uh, magnetic antennas can work very well. 
uh, once we choose an antenna, we have to get it up in the air as much as possible. And one of the ways to do this is with extendable mast types. And a lot of people have the um, these type of extendable masts or the real common one that holds up commercial uh, TV antennas at home uh, that was available at Radio Shack all the time. I'm sure many of you have one of these rusting somewhere in your backyard at this very moment or still up on the side of the house or on the chimney or somewhere. Um, I find that painter poles work very well. They're very lightweight, uh, fiberglass. Uh, they extend up and they have this nice little screw on the top that you can screw into your buddy pole and be all ready to go. So I've used painter poles a number of times. Uh, another option is to use a self-supporting antenna such as a vertical uh, so you don't have to use a mast. A lot of people use these things and they call them masts, but they're not really masts. These were supports for camouflage and they're sold at a lot of ham fests and swap meets as mass supplies but they're really designed as camo support poles they're both fiberglass versions uh, and two types of aluminum versions with different little bit different ends on each of them so these are all uh, pictures of two two ends of each of these one fiberglass two aluminum and i have the statistics here for them the aluminum are a little more expensive but they seem to be stronger especially they have less flex if you're pushing up an antenna and uh you got to be very careful the fiberglass ones if you have too much length and you're trying to push up an antenna uh, it'll start to sag and may snap on you if you are using aluminum and i do suggest though that you finish off with one or two fiberglass at the top if you're using a directional beam to minimize the interference between the uh, mast and the and the beam also it's a little bit less uh, shock danger Again, they'll stay far enough away that you don't have to worry about the, what type of material you hit the power poles with. Just don't hit the power lines. I like to use a 7.2 meter. Uh, it's about 21 foot long. Uh, they're called fiberglass or they're called carbon fiber. Uh, not sure which is which. I don't know if carbon fiber interferes with radio signals. And I'm not even sure what they are because they, they all come from the far east. Uh, you can order them on eBay. Uh, I've spent about 12 bucks for mine. The, the top uh, foot or so is pretty useless because it's very tiny. But what I do is just hang a very thin wire on mine to make a vertical or I make a sloper or make, I use this for a lot of different things. And it collapses down so it's only about a, two feet long and I can easily carry it on my backpack. If you're using a mobile setup with a, with a mass pipe, having a tilt over like this can be very helpful where it'll tilt up. Now, this is an example of a bumper mount, but there's also ones that you can drive onto. Remember, when you are doing something like this, you're probably still going to want to use guy ropes. Uh, you can even have a hole in the ground without a sleeve. I, for many years, I lived in an apartment, and I had my antenna set up for Oscar 10 on a fiber on a PVC pipe mast, and I would bring it out and put it in that hole in the front yard when I was working the east pass, and then bring it in the backyard when I was working the west pass path passes i'm sorry uh getting an antenna up into natural recurring uh support such as trees uh there's a number of different ways you can do it i'm not going to let the video play through here so i'll let you watch the video on your own later but this is a very interesting thing on using throw lines um i've tried a lot of these different things um some people use ladders fishing poles casting bow and arrow slingshot air gun Please don't use the air guns that use the explosive devices. Use the, Go for the compressed air. Um, some people are thinking about drones now, balloons or kites. And I finally found that I had much better um, success when I start using a high quality throw line. It made a big difference on not getting snapped. Just extend my, um, 20, my 20 foot fishing pole reach up and use it to just tweak and, and dump the wire over top of a limb on the tree without having to worry about throwing or doing anything. So that's it for antennas. Let's talk a little bit about it. power. Uh, power is going to be the other big consideration when you're in the field. Some radios have internal power supply, po power. They have batteries in them. A handheld, of course, is an example of the radio that commonly has a battery in it. Uh, some base radios uh, may have batteries in them, but mainly QRP radios. I'll talk about some some of the models here in a few seconds. Um, mobile radio, of course, you have the vehicle battery or an extra battery in the vehicle, so quite often you have power available. Um, we need to figure out how much power we're going to need uh, based on our operations. So these are some, again, some radios with integrated batteries. The uh, 
897 from Yesu, which is no longer available, had the option of having two batteries that fit in the bottom of it. Uh, they were not, they didn't last real long, and they only let you operate the radio at about 40 watts, and they were rather expensive, and the charger was expensive, but they still were a way to get out in the field with a HF radio and operate. Very, very popular new radio, the ICOM 705 has a built-in battery. The Zygu 5105 and the brand new Zygu X6100, which is just coming out right now, has a battery built into it. And of course, the Hellcraft KX2 or the KX3 had the ability to have internal batteries. Here's a chart on different types of radios that have battery packs. And again, all these links are available for you to click on when you go through this presentation. Um, one way to uh, get the power and the the power, the, excuse me, the power requirements and the weight requirements really down is to have a single band or just a, a few band radio. Uh, this is an example of the QCX from Hans out. Uh, is a wonderful little QRP radio. It fits in the palm of your hand. This is the QX, the QX, QCX Mini. Uh, the regular QCX isn't a lot bigger, uh, but it's a full high-performance radio that uh, doesn't have internal battery in it, but doesn't require a lot of battery power. You hook up your battery to it, and uh, you can operate that in the field very easily. The Mountaintop series uh, have been very popular with uh, two and three bands. So let's talk a little bit about power. Um, one of the things is if you are using handheld, sometimes as batteries run out, say you may want to have an external adapter that you can use the battery power from an external battery or from your vehicle. A few radios models do have the ability to feed DC and direct it, but most of them only have DC charging capability. So you may need to buy an adapter if you want to be able to do that to replace your battery. Uh, base radios, you're going to have to go with external batteries, a generator, or there might be AC at the site. Operating portable doesn't mean that you're operating off batteries or or generator necessary that you might be at a portable location that has power. Uh, mobile, of course, your battery pack or generator uh, can be easily hauled in. Now, lead acid batteries, uh, there's a couple different varieties. The flooded lead acid batteries for, or car batteries, as we, we know them, have a high momentary max current and a low depth of discharge. So they're not the best radio to use for powering your radio. They're not the best battery for powering your radio. You want a deep cycle battery uh, such as the absorbed glass mat or the gel cell batteries, which are which will you not kill immediately by using them on your with your radio. Uh, nickel cadmium batteries came out a little while back. Uh, they were a good idea. They were fairly cheap, but they had what was called memory problems. If you didn't completely discharge them and cycle them properly, uh, they could die. But they did have a pretty long uh, lifetime if you didn't kill them by improper charging and discharge. Uh, the next invention that came out was nickel metal hydrate, and that's what I'm running in my KX3. Uh, I've been using a, a set of low discharge batteries that keep their charge for quite a while, even if I'm not using it when it's sitting around the house here. And uh, they work fairly well, but they definitely work better than the ICADs. Lithium-ion uh, batteries solve both the problem associated with the other two types of batteries. They have a full voltage and they suffer no memory problems. Uh, they're not available in standard voltages except for the uh, except for the nine volt size, but uh, there are a number of them that are available as double AA, A, triple A size cells, and they put out 3.7 volts instead of the 1.5 volts. So you'd have to rewire your your setup if you were using these. They require a special charger. Uh, the 186650 is one of the more common types that you'll see available. It looks very similar to a double A battery, but it's not exactly the same thing. And the voltage, of course, is different. They're very commonly used in laptop packs, flashlights, etc. Now, these lithium ions do have a problem. They only are good for about 500 recharges at max, and they do have a history of being flammable. So, what I've settled on for most of my lithium uses is I'm using lithium iron phosphate. The LiPo phosphate batteries seem to be very good. Uh, they don't have the highest specific energy. Uh, but they do have a, uh, a nice safety, lifespan's good, and they work pretty well. The cost is not that bad. So I've been using a lot of lithium um, batteries. Now, when you start buying these lithium batteries, they come in various configurations of serial and parallel configurations. And uh, by putting them in serial and parallel, we can get different voltages and different amperages. So here's an example. You often see them referred to as something like 2S2P, that would mean it's two batteries in serial and two in parallel. 
cells in parallel. So you get 6.4 volts, 10 amps. Now, if you go to a 1SP, 1S3P, you drop your voltage because you only have one in series. So you'd get 3.2, but you'd have 15 amps. A 3S1P would give you 9.6, and you would get 5 amps. So you notice that each of these has a different type of voltage and amperage available. So I'm using four 2SPs and four S4Ps for most of my equipment at 12.8 volts. There's a whole thing from uh, W9. I forget the rest of his call off the top of my head, but you can watch the videos later. And there's another video on choosing batteries from the Smoking Ape. Um, two years ago, for field day, I purchased one of these. I operate QRP, but I'm operating two radios and some accessories. So I wanted something I could use in the field that wouldn't run out. And I wanted something that was lithium phosphate. Most of these battery packs, they're called, they're mis a misnomer of solar generators because you can use these to charge with a solar panel, but they, they call them solar generators, but they're basically a rechargeable battery that you can charge from either solar or from mains or from a generator, however you want to choose to recharge it. Most of them are lithium ion, but I found a couple of them are lithium lithium phosphate and uh, lithium ferric phosphate, and uh, I found it very useful. This particular one has been renamed a SUPA now as opposed to a, a Bowden's, uh, and uh, I operated the entire field day with all my equipment with this. Didn't even use a third of it. Um, I was just looking at a couple days ago, here's two of them at $130 and $205. You notice that these have a generator, so you can use AC devices. They have DC out, they have five volts, they have 12 volts. Uh, they have a flashlight, of course, and uh, they can work for quite a while. And they're not that expensive. I was only looking at models that had lithium ferric phosphate in them, though. These are about six and a half pounds each. One has a uh, fair non they describe it as a non-pure sine wave, so I'd hesitate to run AC equipment that you worry too much about with that one. The other one is a uh, says it has much better um, uh, sine wave, pure sine wave on it. And you'll see a lot of these are advertised as being used for CPAPs. So these, this is an example of a very common one, the Jackeries. So there's a number of them out there. And they're basically just a big storage cell with a handle but they also have an inverter so you can run ac equipment now during field day you're not required to have your computer be on battery power unless it's being used to trans to generate code decode uh send ft8 etc etc so i just said hey i want to be all battery power because sometimes when i operate field day there is no other power so i purchased one of these it's about the size of a big book and it basically operates my laptop all weekend. Puts out 18 volts so I can plug it right directly into the laptop, just like, a, a, like the charger, and it operates for quite a while. Beware, any of these power banks that you're looking at, even those ones for cell phones, all of them, if they have 12 to 18 volt DC in them, they usually don't use that to rate the watt hours. Of course, they use the 5 volt calculation because it'll give a much higher inflated watt hours rating than if you're using the five volt to calculate it so when you calculate out your volt your watt hours make sure it's being calculated with 12 to 18 volts here's an example of another unit this has a nine volt output on it a 12 volt output a, a usb port a little battery switch a little switch here and a little indicator which is real nice and notice again depending on how you're looking at the rating on here it changes uh, if you look at the 5 volt rating, it's 26,000 milliamps, but at the 12 volts, it's only 11,000. Of course, they will advertise this as a 26,000 milliamp supply. Now, this last summer, I discovered something new that I didn't know about. Um, modern uh, USB C ports uh, can deliver different voltages. Uh, to the device and some devices will tell the supply source what voltage they want through the C, through the USB-C cable. Now, if you have a battery pack that is PD, power delivery, has to be power delivery, will be the name on it, PD, and it's a specification that allows you to have a higher power and allows you to use a different range of voltages from the same USB connection.
Now your device either has to be able to tell the PD source what voltage it wants or you can buy these adapter cables. So I saw that there was a cable available that you plugged into the USB on a PD power bank and it had the right connector to go to 12 volts for my, P my KX2 3 or 2, either one it would work with. The problem was this adapter cable was $26. Well, I searched around a little bit more, and I found that you could actually get these two for seven dollars with a different brand, and it actually had the exact right size connector to fit in the Elecraft. So I had the link to that uh, right here on the uh, on this uh, thing, and it also talks about USB power delivery. Some people like to use these car jumpers; uh, they work okay. They're, most of them have lead, sealed lead acid batteries in them. Some of them have lithium, but they aren't lithium phosphate. Different factors affect your battery needs. The amperage of your radio, both transmit and receive, have a direct effect on it. The amount of power that you choose is your output power. The higher your output power level, usually the more uh, amperage your radio consumes. Uh, make sure you're using all your radio's power saving features, things like turning off backlights and things that might not be necessary. Different cycles, um, different modes of operation have different cycles of uh, usage and some modes can require a lot more uh, power over time than others. The amount of time that you're going to be operating, is this going to be a, a, a two hour operation? Is it going to be a 48 hour operation? So you need to plan your battery information, your batteries according to that. What type of operating style are you going to be doing? If you're calling CQ the entire time, you're going to use up a lot more battery than if you're doing hunting and pouncing. Also remember the voltage drop of your power cables. You want to make sure they're as thick as possible and as short as possible to minimize the amount of power you lose through your cables. Different battery types have different charge dis, uh, profiles. So you notice on lithium ion, it has a big drop, a big drop off here. Whereas things such as uh, the, the, the uh, nickel hydride have a very, sh very level. They provide the same uh, voltage for quite a while and then they drop off at the end. Very similar to also what happens with the uh, lithium ferric phosphate. There's a bunch of gadgets you can use. A buck converter allows DC to DC conversion, uh, either to step up or step down your voltages using a minimal number of, co of components. But you do lose a little bit of power. Remember that circuitry does eat up a little bit of your current either way. You might also want a battery monitor such as this. They're available very inexpensively and they're a great way to monitor your batteries. Uh, another way to have power is either a generator uh, by using either a gas or propane. It could be a standalone. It could be one that's mounted on a vehicle. It could be one in your backyard, whatever it might be. Of course, that, that big giant propane one in your backyard would not be very suitable for portable, but it could provide emergency generation power in your house. Um, there's a number of other things you can use, uh, wind, hydro, uh, solar, of course. I'm not sure if any of you have ever done human power. Be ready to uh, have someone help you because it is very tiring to keep the power up. And you're going to need a battery too, by the way, to, uh, to, uh, for when you have the drops in voltage. So you need some sort of battery to smooth it out. Um, three articles on, on how to calculate your battery needs. Uh, if you bring too much battery into the field, uh, you won't run out during the operation, but you may lug a lot more weight than you need to. So you want to pick out a, a good idea of how much battery you're going to need with a little bit of spare not a ton of extra spare and definitely have enough to make your operations that you want i just want to show you this chart real quick because it's very interesting now this is a huge battery it's a 784 amp hour lead battery um, and if we operated at 20 amps basically a 100 watt radio being operated at 100 watts we get about six hours out of it now if we take the same exact 74 amp hour battery and instead, we operate a QRP radio at 5 watts, about 2 amps of transmit power. Notice we now have 76 hours, so 12 times as many hours on the same battery by operating at 5 watts as opposed to 100. Bunch more articles on uh, battery power. Some miscellaneous accessories. Um, might need a microphone, CW paddles, et cetera, depending on how you're operating. Uh, headphones. Even if you're not a headphone person, once you get on the field, you're probably going to want headphones because there's quite often ambient noise. So even if you never use headphones at home, headphones are a good idea in the field for two main reasons. One, 
because of ambient noise. And second, you can back down your audio gain and that decreases your battery consumption. So by using headphones, you can actually conserve battery power. I like to have a foot switch anywhere and I don't, ha I don't, I, I normally pulled on my bag and show you what it looks like right now, but I'm not in person with you, but I found a very inexpensive small metal uh, switch uh, that I use for my foot switch for my radio and it's designed as a tattoo on off switch. And I found it on eBay for just a few dollars. So it's very portable. I can slide it in my pocket or put it in my bag and bring it with me. It's not big and heavy like my home uh, foot switch. Uh, make sure you have all the cables you need all the connectors you can get by by forgetting something and being around a store where you can buy many audio cables usb cables etc but you aren't going to find coax connectors or adapters at your local walmart um, logging if you're gonna use paper and pencil of course that's very easy uh, but if you want to use computers uh, i have a whole presentation on computer logging software both contesting and general software at tiny.cc slash log sw there's also phone apps available. What a lot of people do if they're operating, when I operate portable in the field with satellites where I have all my hands occupied holding the antenna and the radio and everything, I actually use a little digital voice recorder or you can even use your phone to record with and then I transcribe my log afterward. Make sure you bring all the cheat sheets you need with you. If you're gonna be operating field day, for example, a sheet that shows all the sections. If you're operating a, Q a QSO party, all the counties and the exchanges, the zones, the band maps, etc. Make sure you have some sort of clock available to you that has UTC. Don't count on using your cell phone. It's a pain in the neck, a good old watch on your hand, or if some radios have built in um, clocks in them. Or if you're doing computer logging, of course, you don't have to worry about that. Um, Make sure you have update all the software on your computers, make sure everything's ready to go, make sure you have your power supply, your backup batteries, your computer power supply, even if you're not going to be using it in the field so you can have everything charged and ready to go when you do get to the field. I always carry a USB drive with me with backups of all the software that I've installed on my computer in case I'd have to use another computer or reinstall something. PDFs of all the equipment operating manuals that I'm going to be using in the field. Uh, firmware and loading utilities for the radio. So I carry the firmware for my KX2, KX3 with me all the time. So in case I'd have to reload it, same thing with my 705. Um, I also have storage space to back up my logs. If you're operating uh, F, uh, digital and you don't have internet, you're gonna need some way to adjust your time. So a USB GPS is a great way to do time synchronization if you're operating FT8 and FT4 in the field. I was at a cabin in Delaware with no uh, internet for a week after field day, and my time kept getting off after about two days. So I had to drive about five miles to the nearest McDonald's, uh, go through the drive-through and uh, resync my laptop and get a milkshake and then drive back up, back to my cabin. So if I had a UPS uh, G, a GPS with me, I would be able to avoid having to make that trip, but then I wouldn't have gotten milkshakes. So I'm not sure which is better, the milkshakes or the trip. I always like to have a table or chair planned. If I know there's not going to be something there, you can get very portable camping equipment and it can make a big difference as opposed to sitting on the ground. Now, I did operate on a rock in uh, Acadia National Park. Uh, on Cadillac Mountain one time, but it was a, it was two perfectly spaced rocks, and I did have a blanket to cushion the one rock that I was sitting on, so it did work out okay. I like these little plastic folding tables that are uh, only uh, 24 inches wide and uh, 48 inches when you open them up, and you can also set them up at different heights depending on how high your chair is. Here's an example of my friend a 8 lgp on vacation in South Carolina. Notice he brought one of the little folding tables with him. And he had his a little stool. Even though he was in a guest house, he didn't know if he was going to be able to have an operating spot. And what Steve likes to do is before he goes out in the field, he mounts everything on a grid. He takes one of those metal racks designed for kitchen use, and he uses either uh, tie downs or little screw connectors and, and fastens everything. So this was his FT8 station. He has his radio. He has his interface on the back here, which you can't see. He has his computer and he has everything mounted in this grid. So he simply takes that grid and picks it up, sets it on the table and he's ready to operate. When you are going out in the field, you have to bring non-radio things with you. Uh, and these are called the 10 essentials. Anyone that does any amount of hiking or camping is probably aware of these already, but if you're not, 
uh, navigation, sun protection, light, first aid, repairs and tools, hydration, shelter, fire, insulation, and nutrition are the, th the 10. Uh, so I have a bunch of guides on that. You can read through these, watch some videos. I also have another list of the Beyond the Ten Essentials insect repellent. If you're operating, uh, I operated Field Day in Montana one year, uh, and I covered myself in insect repellent, so they bit me under the eyelids, in the ears, and under my fingernails. Every place there was no no mosquito repellent. I probably should have had a net netting set up around me. So these are some of the things you might want to have with you. Some pre-trip planning can make for a successful trip. One of the things you need to do is, first of all, choose what activity or event you're going to do. Choose the type of operation you're going to have. Find a location. I like to pre-scout my locations by using Google Maps and zooming in with Street View and the above views and try and figure out what type of supports I'm going to have. But don't count on that still being there because sometimes those are a few years old and that great tree you saw on the property may not be there when you get there. I always have a checklist of all the equipment I need to bring with me, uh, the documents I'm going to need to have with me, and those are usually on a USB drive and in paper format both. Now, what, the logistics I do when I'm getting ready to go on a on a field tr on a portable operation, my wife and I operate field day portable almost every year. We go travel to some place on our vacation, then operate field day. So what I do is I set up my field day station at home, not in my shack, in another room, so I don't mix the two together. I set up my table, I set up my chair, I set up all my equipment, I set up my antennas, I put my antennas outside, I run my coax, I turn the radios on, I practice operating, make sure everything works, make sure the computer's working. Then I, I stop, shut everything down, and pack it. Nothing goes away from that table until it gets packed. So there's no chance that it's going to get mixed in with my stuff back in my shack again. I'll forget to bring something. So make sure you have an operating station and then pack it. Um, so where you're going to go depends on the activity. Of course, if you want to work summits, you got to go to a summit. If you want to work parks, you got to go to parks. If you want to work islands, you got to go to islands. So that you're sort of uh, fixed into place. Uh, my wife knows for field day, I always want to go to a state with a two-letter abbreviation for the section. Now those big, long three-letter abbreviations. And we go to a state where there's not many hams. So we spend a lot of time in West Virginia, Delaware, Montana, Maine, and Vermont. Whenever you're going to be going out in the field, make sure you know all the possible multipliers or exchanges for the location you're going to be in. So make sure you know what your grid square is going to be, what your, if you're going to be in a park, what the park abbreviation is, uh, if you're going to be on a summit, what the summit abbreviation is. And even if you're doing, going out and activating a summit or a park, also make sure you know what county or counties you're going to be in for people that might be interested in working, knowing what county you're in. So always know your six-digit grid square. There's a wide variety of get those, to get those, and I have more information on that in the next couple slides. So here's information on getting your grid square, either in the field or ahead of time, using maps, uh, apps, computer programs, and even some GPSs will give you your grid square. Here's more information on counties and, and uh, locations. You can go, you go through all these. So let's talk a little bit about packing for our, I already talked a little bit of how I like to pack everything up, get it working, then pack it up. Also, I have a go box available and I have a whole presentation on go boxes. You can click on that link and find that. I also have one on my KX3, uh, which I call a rapid deployment uh, type of go box. There's really a couple different types of go boxes. There's the ones where you pack everything up so it's not going to get damaged, but you have to assemble everything on site. So it's a transport safely but not ready to operate type of setup. And this is very good when you're going to have to worry about people, other people handling, handling your gear or you're going to have rough transportation getting there. One of the problems is it requires a lot of skill at the, the operating site and it requires time to get everything hooked up right. So the rapid deploy is a way around that. You transport safely, but it's in a ready to operate arrangement. So you simply have to open a door or fold something down and it's ready to go. You can also operate in a mobile, operate in motion, which we talked about earlier. And here's an example of some go kits uh, that are fairly rapid deploy. Uh, take the front off, uh, the protective cover off the front, and you're ready to go. 
Here's my go box I created for my KX3. It's a Plano uh, tackle box with four little dividers in there. I've taken all those and use them for other purposes. One still slides in when I'm packing up the go, so I have all my extra supplies that slide in. The top opens up to show you the lithium phosphate battery. Notice in the top of all my go boxes, I put documentation for quick operation of the radio. So when I forget what the what button I need to do or what what this little item you know when a little dot shows up on your display screen you can't remember what the t is there for or what's go what's going on it's nice to have documentation and i always put that right at the top of the go box you can also have backpacks these are modular backpack systems for the 817 this had two articles about that uh here's a backpack from icom and this is not for the 705 this is the 703 which was a predecessor qrp radio that icom had and uh, I actually have one of these in the backpack. Looks like that. And here's the 705, the newest one, and their backpack, which cost, I think, $129 or $159. I forget what it is. It's a very nice backpack, but I found another one that you can buy for under $60. It's basically the exact same backpack, with the one exception it doesn't have the antenna mount on the side of it. So you'd have to make your own antenna mount, but it does have a few other little openings, which are nice. And basically what it is, is it's a camera lens bag, but it works perfectly for the 705. The Zygu uh, X1515 fits into it perfectly also. Now, if you're going to be having a more hostile environment that your radio is being shipped through, you might want to use something like this. It's very protective. These type of Pelican cases and other brands, the Apache series that comes from uh, Harbor Freight. Once you start getting up in big in size, though, think about wheels. Now, one of the things you can do is this is rather expensive to buy these type of packs, but you can buy these type of boxes and then just simply buy a suitcase on wheels. I go to my nearest uh, garage cells in the area. I find the ugliest one I can. I have a bright purple one right now. And nice thing is, if this is sitting on a, on a uh, luggage um, claim on the airport someone might pick this up and run with it whereas if they see my ugly purple suitcase they think it's some grandmother from you know somewhere and they won't touch this ugly purple suitcase but inside it actually has all my radio equipment and my radio equipment is still very safe because it's in these protective devices if you're using something large you're having to move stuff around something on wheels can be very helpful we actually bought one of these for my son when he was in sixth grade and started playing the two because there was no way he could move the case around on his own when he was a little guy and uh if you really want the ultimate in being able to move stuff around the field a folding wagon like this is very helpful we, i bought one of these a couple years ago and tell your your significant other that you're going to bring them to a local concert at the outdoor music venue and you're going to use that to bring all the food in but you can also use it for your portable field operations so mine serves both at blossom music center outside of my area but it also goes to the field um, these are some other things this is a chess pack this Swift is very expensive, but there's a bunch of other cheaper ones available from other sources. You can also make one out of a bass drum carrier or a snare drum carrier. Um, wiring and cable. These little uh, cable winders from um, soda beams are very nice. They keep the wire from getting kinked up. I've also went to these little laundry reels. Uh, this is about life size here. I take out the rope that's in there, and then I can use very thin gauge wire that I use for my QRP operations, wind it up in here, and it doesn't get tangled up. One year, my wife and I got to the location where we were going to operate, and all of my 15 counterpoises for my vertical had gotten into a ball that we never did get cut apart. So these little reels are very helpful. And this is only like three bucks for one of these. Here's a whole article on quick tips, tips on wrapping up wires wrapping up ropes, wrapping up coils, uh, the proper way to wrap up coax, et cetera, et cetera. So these, I'll let you watch these videos on your own. If you're doing a bigger operation like field day and you need a way to haul around lots of coax, power cables, et cetera, these little things designed for hoses work very well. Uh, this was my tackle box being used as a tackle box as opposed to a go box <clears throat> in the little The little containers work very well to carry extra supplies. So I always have extra batteries and extra key, extra connectors, etc. <coughs> so you need to get your wire in the air. 
One of the things that a lot of people have trouble with is getting the stakes out of the ground at their field day. If you have a long pole with a piece of wire on it, uh, steel wire and a hook, you can get a bunch of leverage and pull them up very easily. I use one of these claw clamps. This is very nice because you can clamp it on a metal object, hook up any antenna that you would use as a mobile mount here. And then uh, I have one of the 17 foot MFJ extendable whips that works very well in 20 meters. You hook up your counterpoise, this can be tilted. It can be very useful to, to use that in the field. Let's talk a little bit about uh, operation efficiency. Op I define operation efficiency as the efficiency equals the results divided by the effort involved in putting the operation together. So the results can be based on different things. The number of contacts you make, the activation of a rare location, your standings in a contest or an award, meeting or exceeding personal goals, and the fun you had. Those are all results that you might have. But then you need to divide them by the time spent, the number of people involved, the cost of the equipment, supplies, etc. And what you really want to do is you want to minimize the red and maximize the blue so you move your arrow into the efficient range. These are links for you on, if you don't have a portable operation to try out, here's some for you to try out. POTA, IOTA, World, uh, uh, SOTA, mines on, mines on the air, castles on the air, lighthouses on the air. Now, if you're putting all this effort into operating, use a little bit of effort to announce your operations to other people. Put out a, spots on the clusters. Uh, let people know that you're going to be there. Make sure you're, if you're doing CW that you activate the reverse net, network beacon network by sending CQ occasionally so that it'll, you'll show up on the reverse beacon network. Some of the different operations such as SOTA and POTA have websites where you can post where you're going to be and when you're going to be there. There's apps for your phone available to do spotting. Here's the uh, POTA site. Here's a VHF site for VHF activities. Here's one for satellites on the Gridmaster heat map. And they use Twitter as their way of pa passing on information. Um, here's information on pedestrians. And there's a whole group called the HF Pack group. K0BG is sort of like the godfather of mobile uh, operations and information. Here's his website. It's full of great information. Here's a bunch more sites on operations, mo mobile operations. And what we did locally is we decided enough of our members weren't going out in the field. So we actually created a new activity called Summit Metro Parks because we're in Summit County, Ohio. So we have some Summit Metro Parks on the air. We have all 13 parks and we have 29 uh, trailheads for each of the different bicycle and hiking trails. So members can go out and activate these using any band or mode. Quite often they're with FM Simplex. And then we also have a couple of meetings a year where our club gathers and we do this as a club activity from all different parks. So we get a lot of park to park activity. And they're all very quick drives. The closest one to me is less than a two minute drive from my house. So again, the link for tonight's presentation is tiny.cc slash port op. And if you need a PDF version, you can click on that. I'll put this link into the slideshow. Oops, let me try that again. Yep, forget that. We, we won't, we'll go back to just bring it up here on the screen. Also, all my presentations are available at tiny.cc slash k8zt-p, and I'll type both of these into the chat when I'm done here presenting. And that gives you links to all my presentations. Again, if your local club or organization is, is interested in the presentation, I'm trying to do PAS, present all states. I've got over 35 states and uh, three different countries, and I've done over 110 presentations since uh, COVID started. So if you need a presentation, I'll be happy to do one on any of the topics. So I will stop screen sharing and I'll take questions. And I'll also put the link in the chat here. All right, Barry, you wanna go through the start on the, on the chat, please? Sure. Uh Oscar wanted to know how much time a good portable station can take to set up from antenna to radios and power operation. 
Well, it really depends on wh- what type of operation you want to do. You know, if, if I'm just going out and operating uh, a park and I want to activate a park, I may just throw, I may just extend my, an- my, my antenna on my HT and operate, you know, FM simplex. So it might be a matter of seconds. Or if I want to settle in and do, a, you know, a fill day, I typically set up my stuff ahead of time. So it really only takes me about a, two hours to get set up for field day at a typical site. The biggest thing is, as I said, my wife and I travel for field day, so I don't know what the site is going to be until I actually get there. And quite often we use bed and breakfast and cabins that we rent. So I'm not sure what it's going to be like until I actually get there. So it actually takes me, we usually arrive there on Friday and I spent most of Friday evening deciding what I'm going to do. And then I get up early on Sunday morning and get set up for field day uh, with my antennas, depending on the situation. But it really is very different. But again, you know, if you have the radio mounted in the car that's powered by the car, you park, you put up a, you push up a mast real quick, you can do this very quickly. So it depends on what you want to do, but it really does not take that long. Okay. Uh, What battery chemistry yields the highest amp hour hour by weight? That I don't know. You're going to have to look through the charts, but it's probably not something you're going to want because A, it's probably going to be too expensive, and B, it's probably not going to be as stable. So really what you want is not the highest, but you want the most effective, price effective, and operation effective. So go ahead and take a look at the charts and see what meets your needs. I like the lithium iron phosphate myself, especially the fact that it has twice as many recharges as lithium ion. Right. Some of the pictures you had with the uh, totable uh, HF radios. Yes. How do you, do you do the, uh, with all the new RF exposure ratings? Uh, is well, that dangerous? I mean, do you have to do, uh, do you have to do calculations for that nowadays? Yes, I, I run off, I run five watts maximum, so the, it decreases my uh, exposure. Um, but when I'm operating out in the field quite often, I'm using, I'm not necessarily using one that's attached to the, as I was showing there, it's not always a, a, a media attached antenna. It may be further off. But again, I try and keep my co- – the coax gets very heavy when you're carrying it. So I try and keep my coax runs as short as possible. So I I would rather go with lower power and more efficient antennas. But it can be a problem. If you want to run 100 watts on your backpack, I would suggest not doing that. Well, even if you were 100 watts in a car. Yes. You have, you gotta, nowadays, you've got to take that into consideration. If yeah. it's, you know, if it's on the roof above you, you're going to be uh, susceptible to, to uh, being exposed. Uh, that's all the questions in the chat. Some very good comments. So someone mentioned they have an outbacker on their car for mobile. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and there's no reason that you can't, uh, you know, drive a short walk in a park. So it doesn't have to be strenuous. It doesn't have to mean that you're climbing a mountain. Okay, have you ever used a mobile with an external generator and an antenna? Yes, but um, you have to be careful that you don't mix things up. So just remember, if you're using an external generator, you don't want to hook, you don't want to use the same car ground. I mean, you you don't want to mix systems. Even if you're using, even if you're using a secondary battery in a vehicle, you want to be careful about not mixing systems unless they're designed to be hooked together. Um, I really like uh, I really like these what they call solar generators. I, I don't like the misnomer of what they call them, but these big battery packs can really save you from having to haul gasoline out into the wilderness and run a generator and worry about maintaining a generator. It that that battery pack I was showing you before would easily run a hundred watt radio for a number of hours in the field uh, without having to worry about you know running a generator. And those don't weigh as much as the generator. No, it's about uh, six to eight pounds. They are, they're not cheap, but those two I showed you that were $130 and 200 and some dollars are, would easily let you go out and operate for four hours at your local park without any problem at all at 100 watts. But drop the power down to 20 watts and you'll last even longer and you won't notice a difference. Other questions, comments, complaints? Dan gets all complaints. I'll take questions and comments. This is true. This is true. 
boy, this this is a really you do really good presentations. I if I was a club and I need a presentation, I'd be knocking on your door. Well, the, the, I actually did my last my my first in person presentation last week. I hadn't done an in person presentation for quite a while, so I packed up all my portable stuff, and they got to see all my portable stuff at the presentation, which I can't do with you all tonight. But uh, the one nice thing about this is I can do it anywhere, anytime. I was going to ask so, what the pros and cons are. Someone wants to know if you could expand on what you were saying about mixing systems in the vehicle. Yes. You know, you, you have a 12 volt system in your car, and some of the devices may use your chassis as your ground, so you don't want to tie an electrical system in any way into your car ground. So if you have a radio that's mounted in your car and you're using an external battery source, it's just too easy to uh, accidentally possibly tie the two together. And one battery won't win. Mm -hmm. We do have a hand up here from uh, Ontario, Canada. Go ahead, Brett. Thanks, Dan. Good evening, Anthony. Uh, really a good uh, presentation. Really enjoyed that. And just want to tell you that I use a uh, Tar Heel seventh, or I'm sorry, a Tar Heel screwdriver on uh, and an ICOM seven thousand for field day, and I've left it on the back of the vehicle with a seventy foot length of uh, coax to the vehicle and parked it away and had just a battery beside me, and I found I had a really great time using that to uh, just leave the the antenna right on the vehicle gave me a great ground plane and uh, I just stayed on one frequency and I, I did fine. And as you know, the Tar Heel, they have multiple frequencies in that. I put a, ca a capacity hat on it plus the six foot whip and I was running uh, 160 and it was uh, really an interesting uh, field day. I had a good time. But just a suggestion that you can leave the antenna on the vehicle and still be still be able to do a lot of uh, great connections uh, just, you know, at on field day. I was amazed how many I got. But great, it was a great presentation, and thanks for your time. Well, thank you. You you reminded me of a situation where I used my my local uh, metal objects as my ground plane. I was in uh, Albuquerque on a Sunday before a meeting I was going to attend the, on Monday, and I brought it was the VHF UHF contest. I had my eight seventeen, and all I had was the rubber duck, that six meter rubber duck that comes with it, with a little piece that you always lose, and uh, I had that with me, and. I was in a hotel with a balcony all around it with three floors. So I went up on the third floor of balcony and I used the downspouts and the different balcony things as counterpoises to make stations louder. And I worked enough stations that I actually got the first place QRP for the New Mexico section for the AW World VHF contest that year. Wow. I, so I worked Kansas and Missouri and different places on six meters with that little rubber duck whip. But really the balcony made a big difference in my counterpoise. It was a comment, gas powered generators operated in parks are usually required to have a US Forest Service approved spark arrester. So that's one reason why you wanna use the batteries instead of hauling gas. Yeah. I tell you, you can find more ways to have fun with this hobby. This is great, great information you're sharing there. We're cleared in the chat and we're cleared for the hands. Okay. Anything, anybody else has got any comments, experience, whatever they want to share real quick? If no one has anything, I'm going to go back to my advertisement again. Okay, go ahead. I appreciate that. <laughs> so November 17th, I'm going to be doing a program on gifts for amateur radio operators. And we really suggest you invite your significant others or the, whoever might give you presents. Invite new hams, invite all hams as usual to the to the Rat Pack presentations. We'd also like your help beforehand. So if you would be able to fill out this short poll and I'll put it in the chat here real quick. Um, this, oh, let's see if I can get the right one here. Let's get this in the chat. But it didn't go in there. Let's try that one more time. And Dan from California has a question, Dan. Okay, so this is the link in the chat for the uh, present for the so short survey on the types of equipment that you would think that you'd like to get or that might be very beneficial for another person. And I will go ahead and stop my screen share and take the next question. Uh, one, before I call on Dan, I'd like to be sure to ask you, can you send me 
uh, that both those pre presentations, one of you tonight, and your advertisement things, like yes, stuff out there. Appreciate that. You okay. already got the email with the advertisement in it. All right, <laughs> Mo Dan, take it away. Um, Anthony, I'm sometimes thought of as a hard to please guy, but I think this is the fourth or fifth presentation of yours I've watched, and I've learned a lot at every one. So um, keep doing it, and. Uh, I looked up, I tried to look up that SUFA quote solar generator uh, just to satisfy my prurient interest and I couldn't find anything. I probably spelled it wrong. Well, I'm finding that it's not, it's not currently available when I looked at it. That's why I brought up those other two that I found that look, they're a little bit smaller. They're not 380, but they're 200 and some. So let me bring that slide up here real quick. Well, it, it's a fun thing to make your own with power yes. connections. And uh, those uh, those red and white um, lunch insulated lunch boxes. I've got one with I think a 32 amp hour LiFePo battery in it. Another one with a 100 amp hour. And then if you want to use a couple of 100 amp hour um, LiFePos in uh, parallel, you get one of those $19 Rubbermaid containers with latching tops. And uh, just to, you know, assemble it yourself as you would and stick on yes. however many power pole connections you want on the outside. So there's one in the back of my truck that's continuously charged when I'm running the engine with a, um, uh, a QTEC um, LiPo4 specific charger off the uh, truck's inverter. And then I throw in a, a folding solar panel or, or a flexible solar panel. And... Uh, it probably has more stamina than I do. Yeah, uh, the, and OH8, uh, I think it's TSN, the, the gentleman that's on the YouTube, um, has a great uh, one where he builds one of these also in his on his on one of his YouTubes. But these are the two that I just found. And I'm not saying that these are the only two, but I I, I think for the few dollars extra, I would go definitely go with lithium ferric phosphate as opposed to the lithium ion because they, they – they theoretically have twice as many charges recharges available in them. Um, actually, I think like the Renegade and uh, Battleborn claim they're good for five thousand charges, but that's full discharges, like to zero percent, which is really not a good idea. Yeah. And you don't want to charge them below thirty-two degrees. Is the only, you know, caution I've come across. Uh, th three eighths inch chain link works great well as a throw weight to get antennas in the trees. Uh, so that's that's one of the things he was talking about. Oh, by the way, when you're out operating in the field, if you're doing verticals, don't pass up a chance to use a good chain link fence as extra counterpoise. Those little clamp on brackets just get a nice make a nice uh, clean uh, connection between your ground and the and the uh, the fence. I've done that numerous times. Um, where in one nice case, I had a place uh, that I was renting that had four chain link fences coming together in the back corner of the property. So I was able to use all that ground plane without having to put out counterpoises uh, to operate. So don't pass those chances up. There was a situation where I was living uh, just a couple, maybe five miles from the Kennecott Copper Mine in Utah. And I used the chain length fence for a vertical I mount to it. And I tell you, that copper ground, <laughs> it worked. Okay. Uh, uh, how soon do you need the survey? Because the uh, Mike from Los Angeles needs to think about it. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this thing together and I'm presenting on the 17th. So I need it, I need it by the 15th at least at the latest. But preferably a little earlier than that. But they make you know, when you work for the Rat Pack group, they don't give you much time to, you know. So I had to I had to be updating it to the last minute. Okay. No, if if you've ever seen any of my presentations, when I'm done tonight, tomorrow I will go through this and think of the things I forgot to add to it. That's why they get so long. Um, so each time I give the presentation, I end up adding a few slides afterward from the questions and the comments I get. Okay. So um, they're they're always that's why I do use the uh, Google shared slides so I can keep updating them all the time. But yeah, if you could get the surveys to me by the 14th or 15th would be great. And, you know, please share those with other people that you know uh, that don't come to these meetings. Uh, share that link for the survey and it'd be great to get some suggestions. 
Okay, Tom, you want you want to say something there, Tom? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, if you're going to tap into any existing structure like a chain link fence, be a gentleman about it and bring along a can of galvanil spray from whichever brand you like. Uh, and after you've made your connection and you're getting ready to go home, spray the scar on the fence rail with, with the Rust-Oleum galvanil or something like that. Don't leave bare metal on somebody else's fence to rust and corrode. Yeah, thank you. Very good advice. Yes. Good advice. Okay, this is, uh, we'll start wrapping this up unless we've got some more comments, suggestions, whatever. Okay, okay. Uh, Dan's got his head up again. Go take it away, Dan. Um, sociological differences around here. Got a lot of stock fence. And, um, you know, you can clamp anything to it and you won't do as much damage as the next time a bull tries to walk through it. <laughs> pros and cons of everything there, Dan. Pros by, by the way, do not you try and use electrical fences for this purpose. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you read, never mind. That's a whole different subject here. Uh, okay. Oh, but by, by the way, let me just mention one thing for safety purposes. Do not use light poles to clamp onto. Do not use metal light poles because quite often they won't. Ha they they are not insulated well, and if you I, I was one time playing basketball and leaned against the back, the, 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 the support for the hoop, and then touched one of those poles, and I got zapped but good because the light pole next to it was not completely insulated inside. So never use anything that has electrical in it. That, that's not appropriate. That explains your energy here. Okay. We're going to make this a last call. Let's just, uh, somebody else has got something to say. Thank you all for coming. Yes, thank you, Mr. U.S. Navy Corpsman. <laughs> I like that hat. <laughs> okay, 73 is everyone. I'll, leave it, I'll leave it open. Thank you, Dan. We'll Thanks so much. Diana has a question. Oh, Diana, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. The last comment just reminded me on another program that we, uh, somebody brought up that when they were doing an e -com, they were in a parking garage and they put the ground to the light pole and that was probably not the best yes. choice and they said well they figured it would be grounded so thank you for bringing that point up again that was it, really it might good. be grounded and electrified too <laughs> exactly and we don't know who's around or how everything's put together so thank you very good guys oh, it was a great great best ground in the world is a fire hydrant <laughs> I always thought railroad tracks would be nice for 160, but not if there's an active train on it. This is true. Pick pick a, some tracks. It's got some rust build on, on it from lack of use. Okay. We'll say 73s, everybody. We'll see you next week. Somebody before that. Yeah. Thanks so much. We'll get this information into out there as soon as possible. Hey, Dan, can you give me a quick phone call? I, I have something I need to do on a spreadsheet with you. You got it. Thanks. 73. Thank you, everybody. Take care now.